as of 2018, the median annual household income for the suburban town of Hounslow in West London was £29,310, a far cry from the close to £45,000 for the City of London. However, for Hounslow resident Navinder Sarau, pulling in £45,000 over any 24-hour period was only a rare occurrence in the sense that he usually made many multiples of that. To put things into perspective, by May of 2010, seven years into his trading career, Sarau routinely posted six-figure profits on a daily basis. $876,823 on May 4th, $435,185 on May 5th, and $879,018 on May 6th the day $1 trillion in market value was wiped out in an event the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission claim had in part been precipitated by Navinder Sarau's trading activities. The socially awkward Sarau might have come from humble beginnings, starting his career at a tiny trading arcade above a Waitrose supermarket but records show that he routinely placed bigger orders than the world's largest banks and hedge funds. Like Jesse Livermore close to a century before him, Sarau had savant-like abilities when it came to reading order flow. By the early to mid-2000s, this skill had evolved from reading the tape in the manner traders like Livermore did in the early 20th century to reading the digital order ladder with its flashing bid and ask prices, pulsating in and out of existence several times per second. Sarau's trading style relied heavily on intuition, fueled by pattern recognition. Author Liam Vaughn describes the process thus in the book Flash Crash. The last 12 times I saw the price moving this way, this other thing happened 85% of the time, so I'll buy. While other traders often have complicated multi-screen setups, feeding them news, charts, and analysis, Sarau's dual-screen setup was exceedingly rudimentary, consisting of a price ladder and a simple price chart. According to Sarau, these charts represented a graphical image of people's fear and greed, and combined with the order ladder allowed him to gauge market sentiment. He eschewed stop losses, and instead preferred to quote-unquote let his positions breathe. A trade sometimes takes time to play out, moving in an undesirable direction, before ultimately correcting course. It's easy to second-guess oneself, so in addition to blocking out other people, out of fear the back-and-forth of ideas might pollute his thinking process, he would often leave his seat and wait for a trade to play out. Not that his time horizon was that far into the future, though. As he described to Andrew Thornhill, a tax barrister who had helped put together one of Sorrell's multiple ill-fated adventures into the world of offshore financial structures. His trading strategy was basically in and out, in and out. Sorrell's story is also fairly instructional in that it illustrates how half-measures on the part of successful entrepreneurs and investors to pay less taxes by moving their assets but not themselves, offshore, can often backfire. Sarau even fell for an international Ponzi scheme in his quest to put to work the vast fortune he had amassed through trading. But going back to his trading strategy, it was essentially old-school scalping using a computer mouse. None of the fancy automated algorithms employed by high-frequency trading firms. As time progressed and HFTs proliferated, 
Sorrel would pay various programmers to develop a system introducing an element of automation to his trading, enhancing his natural abilities, something that would eventually get him into big trouble. Still, even with this enhancement, he was still very much an OG point-and-click trader, scalping a tick here, a tick there and he would usually make sure he ended the trading day flat without holding any positions overnight. This was by no means prescriptive, as some of Sarau's biggest winners were the fruit of overnight positions. One such instance was a series of trades over a two-week period in early 2008 that would catapult him to the status of millionaire. This episode definitely ranks up there with Hertz's 665% post-bankruptcy rally in the summer of 2020, as proof that the markets are anything but efficient. If they were, Sarau wouldn't have been able to profit off the actions of rogue trader Jérôme Kerviel. You see, Kerviel, a trader at Société Générale, had been taking unauthorized speculative positions with the bank's money. While he had initially been successful, generating $2 billion in profits for the firm in 2007 alone, Kerviel was now trying to prop up DAX futures in the mistaken belief that the worst of the 2007-2008 downturn had already passed. Given that the bottom of the market was falling off in slow motion, the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers still two and eight months away, respectively, this was a completely futile attempt. The DAX futures would slide alongside other world indices throughout regular trading hours, from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Central European Time, after which time Carviel would single-handedly try to support the market, using Société Générale's capital. This would have the effect of temporarily buoying up prices for a few hours. But as Sarau noticed, this never lasted beyond the 10 p.m. close, and by the following morning, German futures would resume their daily march towards oblivion. So for close to two weeks in early January 2008, Sarau would short the market overnight, and then come into the office the next morning to see that the shadowy figure on the other side of the trade had indeed once again failed to confer levitating properties to Germany's futures market. Eventually, Calviel either came clean to his superiors where they finally decided to rein in on his extracurricular activities, if you will, landing him behind bars and putting an end to Sorau's highly profitable detour. By the late 2000s, Sorau had amassed tremendous wealth, and his style of trading had evolved to counter the rise of high-frequency traders and other big-ticket human players like Igor Oystatcher and James Chewy. One tactic was gaming the Chicago Mercantile Exchange's indicative opening price calculation. This refers to a 15-minute hiatus in trading between 3.15 and 3.30 p.m. Central European Time, during which window traders are allowed to enter non-binding orders used to determine the opening price. At T-30 seconds, the price would lock in around the point where the greatest number of buyers and sellers met. Needless to say, this system is perfectly balanced and without loopholes, right? Well, nowadays it is probably much more balanced, but back then a large player could just come in and flash a large cluster of orders worth hundreds of millions of dollars. This would have the effect of falsely conveying to other market participants that a trend had been established and inviting them to pile on. This market whale would then cancel his or her orders just shy of the 30-second mark. 
So you could, for example, drive the price lower, cancel your sell orders just before T-30, and then buy at the open in the knowledge the price would likely go up. After all, why would it not, considering your spoofed orders were the reason the market opened lower in the first place? Posting under the pseudonym of Datsa Fugazi, Sarau bitterly recounted his interactions with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and how they didn't seem to care about spoofing, the practice of flashing fake orders you have no intention to execute with the intention of manipulating market sentiment. Sarau was vehement in his belief that this practice was rampant. And quite frankly, given the fact that over 90% of all e mini orders are cancelled, I find it difficult to disagree on this issue. Given the widespread use of gamesmanship to gain an edge in the market, Sarau had a semi-automated trading system built for him. For example, this framework augmented his natural abilities through the use of a cancel-if-close function, which guaranteed his spoofed buy or sell orders would trail the best bid or ask by a predetermined number of ticks. Without this, you would have had to enter new orders manually every single time the market moved, a complete impossibility in today's era of lightning-fast high-frequency traders. Since the purpose of these orders was merely to influence market psychology, he also made sure the system would move his spoofs to the back of the book every time a new order was detected. To this end, he employed a simple but clever system leveraging the Chicago Mercantile Exchange's order queue. Orders are executed on a first-come, first-served basis for any price level. So in order to avoid having his spoofs eaten into, his setup would alternate between increasing or decreasing his order size by one lot, sending it to the back of the queue. If you've ever spent any time trading on most cryptocurrency exchanges, then you'll know what I'm talking about, because this type of strategy is standard operating practice in that space. Eventually, the repeated use of these strategies, including on the day of the May 6, 2010 flash crash, would get Sarau in trouble with a number of regulatory agencies and the U.S. Department of Justice. This would propel Navinder Sarau to the front page of newspapers worldwide, who quickly dubbed the unassuming trader the Hound of Hounslow. 